but anyway, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm gonna give the con over to Madasser to give his talk today. Thank you, Lenore. Um, I would be sharing my slide right now. So I hope that all of you guys can see the slides. Today, uh, I'm going to be presenting um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Jatindra Polywal, uh, who is also my uh, supervisor, and I am working under his supervision uh, in various projects. So the topic for today is from hole to flower, how storage and milling impact the pulse quality. So before we plunge into the topic in depth, uh, first of all, we would just look at why pulses. Uh, so pulses are basically drought resistant and uh, nitrogen fixing crops that have diverse roles in agriculture, environment, food security and human nutrition. So they are considered an ethical and sustainable source of protein. And despite limiting concentrations of uh, sulfur containing amino acids, pulses when they're combined with cereals, they can actually establish a complete amino acid profile, which is necessary for a healthy diet. Um, considering that the regular consumption of pulses, either in whole or processed forms, improves the gut health and has a preventative effect on cardiovascular diseases such as um, uh, cancer, diabetes, sensory characteristics such as texture, crunchiness, crispiness, etc., um, are particularly particularly important to encourage the consumption of uh, th this kind of healthy food stuff. Um, and when we talk about the specific end products, so the suitability of pulse flowers for specific end products depends on the flower parameters such as uh, starch damage and protein quality with milling method having a significant impact on these uh, parameters. Also similar looking flowers may have very different properties as a function of various milling techniques. Uh, blending the flowers obtained from different milling mills changes their overall chemical composition and particle size distribution, uh, which in turn affects the functional and nutritional properties of the flower, affecting the quality of the end products as a result. So since there are no standard characterization methods for uh, the pulse flowers in existence right now, so characterizing them based on pulse type and milling method streams uh, plays an important role in understanding on how well we can develop the specific end products. So for the sake of simplicity, uh, we are going from whole to flower. So this presentation will be divided into two categories. Uh, the first category will be safe storage guidelines development. Um, this will include uh, two subtopics. Uh, the first one, development of safe storage guidelines for pulse crops. And the second will be um, more focused on the utilization of hyperspectral imaging slash spectro spectroscopic techniques for the assessment of quality of Canadian grown Kabuli chickpeas as a case study. The second part of the presentation or the second category will be pulse flower characterization, under which we will cover the evaluation of different milling methods and pulse seed pretreatments on pulse flower characterization. Uh, non-destructive characterization of pulse flowers from different milling methods. And the last topic that we will cover will be the molecular characterization of green lentil flowers using synchrotron X-rays and Fourier transform uh, mid-infrared techniques. So um, when we move to category one, the first topic that we're gonna discuss is a development of safe storage guidelines for cobbly chickpeas. This has also, uh, this work has also been published in Journal of Stored Products Research. Um, if you guys want to have a profound look at it, please uh, feel free to visit uh, this uh, this uh, this topic uh, on Google Scholar, and you will find the whole detailed publication here. Um, so, when we look at the development of storage studies for Kabuli chickpeas, we had stored the Kabuli chickpeas in different temperature and relative humidity regimes. Um, and the parameters that we evaluated were uh, germination, protein content, moisture content, mold growth, fatty acid composition over uh, the period of storage. Uh, moreover, during storage, we also took the spectral profiles of uh, uh, 
um, the Dutch chickpeas that were coming from different temperature and relative humidity uh, storage conditions. Um, so when we talk about different storage conditions, we will also um, show you how we stored these uh, chickpeas for these storage studies. So first of all, we did a sample conditioning. Um, so when the chickpeas arrived in the lab, we measured the wet basis moisture content, which was uh, around 11%. And the, then the chickpeas were uh, conditioned to different moisture levels of 9%, 11%, 13%, and uh, 15%. Uh, we used three different storage temperature conditions and four different relative humidities in storage. Uh, so the, the temperatures were 10, 20, and 30, whereas the relative uh, humidity conditions that we used were 54%, 65%, 75%, and 94%. So the samples that were um, possessing an initial moisture content of 9% after uh, conditioning were stored uh, under 54% relative humidity. The ones with 11% were stored at 65% relative humidity. And similarly, uh, you can see 13 were stored in 75 and 15% were stored in 94. Looking at the storage setup, we had, um, uh, we stored these samples in uh, pails and we had the real sample in the middle. We had the buffer samples on the top and the bottom um, of, 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 of the main sample that we were using for the analysis. Um, I think I will plunge into the results immediately. And what we got here uh, in this slide is we can see three plots. So plot A is basically uh, uh, how the moisture content changed during storage at 10 degrees centigrade. Plot B shows the same thing uh, for 20 degrees centigrade, and plot C shows the change in moisture content uh, at 30 degrees centigrade. So moisture content of the chickpeas were at, at each temperature witnessed a statistically significant increase with respect to temperature, uh, storage period, and the relative humidity. So if you see here in the first plot, we can see that the ones that were stored at uh, that had an initial moisture content of 9%, uh, at the end of the storage period of 16 weeks, we could see that the moisture content increased to 12.5%. Uh, here, the ones with initial moisture content of 9% at 20 degrees centigrade, uh, at the end of the storage period, the moisture content was recorded to be 13%. And the one, uh, the ones possessing initial moisture content of 9% here, at 30 degrees centigrade, we can see that the moisture content increase was incredible. And at the end of the storage, we, we found out the moisture content was uh, around 14%. So um, moisture content in this case was positively correlated with the temperature and the period of storage. Um, and uh, at 30 degree centigrade, you can see that the increase in moisture content of the samples was very high as compared to that of uh, samples that were stored at uh, 20 degrees and at 10 degrees centigrade. Um, when we go to the, the next slide, we see that uh, we can see three different plots of germination. Uh, similarly, starting from the left, it was 10 degrees centigrade. Um, uh, the one in the middle is at 20 degrees centigrade and one at uh, the right is at 30 degrees centigrade. So the initial germination of the chickpeas uh, was recorded to be 97%, the germination rate. Um, but at 10 degrees centigrade, if, we, if you see at 10 degrees centigrade here, um, the germination of uh, the per germination percent stayed over 85% for the samples that were kept at uh, uh, 54, 65, and 75 percent uh, relative humidities, which means the initial moisture content of 9, 11, and 13 percent. But the ones that possessed an initial moisture content of 15 percent uh, and were stored at a relative humidity of 94 percent, the germination actually dropped to somewhere around uh, 50 percent at the end of the storage period. And uh, we can see during the 14th week, of uh, storage, the germination at this high relative humidity uh, dropped uh, below um, 80%. On the other hand, if we see at 20 degrees centigrade, all the, 
the samples that were stored at lower relative humidities and had lower initial moisture contents still maintained uh, an acceptable germination rate throughout the storage period. Uh, but at, at 20 degrees centigrade, we can also observe that the ones that were stored at higher relative humidity conditions, the germination actually dropped uh, below 80 uh, on the fifth week of uh, storage. Uh, the situation was pretty bad for um, the samples that were stored at 30 degrees centigrade. Um, because here we can see that germination has started to drop incredibly quickly. Uh, and for the samples that were stored um, at very high relative humidity conditions, the germination uh, dropped um, to, to less than 80% in the, in the third week of storage. Um, so then the, the conclusions that we got from, uh, from this analysis were that uh, germination of the samples at the high moisture uh, declines quickly uh, during storage and the high temperature has a negative correlation uh, with germination. And applying the ANOVA, it also showed that moisture content, temperature and storage period, they significantly influenced uh, the germination rate of uh, chickpeas during storage. Uh, the next parameter that we looked at was visible mold. So as you can see, this is a very simple table here where we have three different types of temperatures, 10, 20, and 30 degrees centigrade. And then we have uh, the initial moisture contents of 9, 11, 13, and 15%. Um, we can see that there was no visible mold uh, that, uh, that, that was recorded at 10 degrees centigrade. So all the samples had no visible mold. At 20 degrees centigrade, during the 13th week, we saw uh, the, the, the the visible mold uh, in, in different samples. And similarly, uh, the ones that were stored at 20 degrees centigrade. Um, and when we see 30 degrees centigrade, we observed visible mold in the fourth week of storage for those samples that possessed uh, an initial moisture content of 15%. Um, and we found visible mold on the 10th week of storage for the samples that possessed uh, the moisture content of 13%. So uh, that is why uh, we, we, we observed that at 10 degrees centigrade, it is possible to store chickpeas without uh, having a problem with the visible mold. And for 20 degrees, only 15% moisture content showed visible mold. And at 30 degrees centigrade, after five weeks, we started to observe uh, visible mold. Now here we are talking about uh, the fatty acid value and these results were uh, also very interesting and they and can actually be correlated to uh, the moisture content and germination as well. So in the first plot if we see that uh, th this is for 10 degrees centigrade, this is for 20 degrees centigrade and this one is for 30 degrees centigrade and we can see that the fatty acid value has uh, incredibly changed quickly uh, for the samples that were stored at 30 degrees centigrade instead of the ones that were stored at lower temperatures uh, in different relative humidity regimes. So we observed actually a positive correlation between uh, the fatty acid value, moisture content, storage time, and storage temperature. And the samples that were stored at 30 degrees centigrade, especially the ones um, at very high relative humidity of 94%, they showed uh, an increase in FAV content over the period of storage. And this increase was attributed to the rapid uh, hydrolytic reactions. Um, uh, moreover, uh, we can also say that in 30 degrees centigrade, as we saw in the previous slide, that visible mold uh, was a huge issue at higher moisture contents and temperatures. And that mold has also uh, contributed towards uh, the production of more uh, free fatty acids. During the storage period, uh, the crude protein did not change at all. Uh, we did not see any huge differences in uh, crude protein content over the storage period for, for the samples stored under different storage uh, conditions. Um, and the study concluded that chickpeas are not considered safe to store at germination rates of lower than 80%. And the best way to store chickpeas is to store them at uh, 
lower temperatures, but if they need to be stored at higher temperatures or uh, like 30 degrees centigrade, so the moisture content needs to be reduced to uh, 11% before the sixth week of storage. So in category one, we are again moving forward towards the safe storage guidelines development uh, category, and we are going to track the quality of chickpeas during storage using near infrared uh, spectroscopy. So why we have done that? Because usually uh, we can measure the quality, we can measure the protein, uh, the, the protein content or fatty acid content and germination and everything we can measure and we can see, access the quality when we have the labs in place, we have the proper infrastructure in place, we have uh, the skilled labor to do the job. But at the points of trade where we need some kind of reliable and rapid methodologies to assess the quality. Um, how can we track these the, the history of these samples? How can we see that if these samples have been stored in, in uh, the appropriate storage conditions? Uh, so for that purpose, we the objective was to classify the chickpeas based on storage conditions using non-invasive quality assessment techniques that are fast, that are reliable, that are environmental friendly, that do not need much sample preparation and that do not need uh, skilled labor to check the results. Um, in this case, we used visible NIR and shortwave infrared hyperspectral imaging. Uh, in the methodology, I'll not go into the details uh, of how we did that, but we did thresholding of the images. We uh, split our data sets into external validation and calibration sets. We looked for outliers in our data the, the, the major thing that I'm going to focus on here is the modeling part. And here we developed principal component analysis models to check the quality. And we developed partial least squares discriminant analysis models to uh, discriminate chickpeas based on uh, temperatures of storage and relative humidities of storage. Um, so if you see here, this is the spectral profile of whole chickpeas. Um, in the wavelength range of 400 to 1000 nanometers, which is the visible NIR range, of course. And these spectra are colored by uh, the, the, the relative humidities of storage. Now here, when we applied the principal component analysis, we got the scores plot. And these scores plots actually depicted um, the changes in quality of chickpeas. For example, here, if you see in the first scores plot, we have 10, 20, and 30 degrees. So our samples are grouped based on temperatures of storage. In the second scores plot here, we can see that our samples are uh, grouped based on the relative humidities of storage. So we can see that the ones that were stored at 54% relative humidity are very nicely discriminated from the ones that were stored here in yellow uh, in 94% in uh, relative humidity. And we can see actually a transition. We can actually see clear groups uh, in which we can, we can see that the samples, these samples had different quality. These samples had different storage conditions um, during, uh, and these storage conditions, uh, and these, uh, these, this, these changes in quality can also be depicted by the principal component analysis scores plots. Here, we tried to develop a model in which we wanted to discriminate the samples based on uh, temperatures of storage. And here you can see that 10, 20, and 30. So the ones that were at 30 degrees centigrade, they can actually clearly be discriminated uh, from the ones that were stored at lower temperatures. Um, so that concludes uh, the 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 whole beat, the the whole uh, pulse part, and now we are going to go to pulse flower characterization. So the first topic that we are going to cover under this category is evaluation of milling methods and pulse seed free treatments on pulse flower uh, characterization. So now, um, um, if we look here. Um, and if you plunge into the literature a little bit, we can see that bulk of the pulse flower milling research has been uh, related to dry fractionation process, which involves first grinding the pulse material into flour, often using an impact mill such as uh, a pin mill, followed by separation and isolation of the proteins, starch, and the fiber fractions based on their different sizes, masses, and densities using currents of an air classifier. 
So these pulse fractions are used for uh, used as food ingredients to increase the nutritional profile of the end product, as well as impart flavorable taste and appearance to food products. Most established papers that were written on uh, pulse flowers have focused on the determination of the compositional, physical, and functional properties of ground pulses. And this has often involved uh, converting the whole or split pulses into pulse flowers using laboratory scale uh, batch grinders that are commonly used in research facilities to prepare materials into ground or powder form for analysis. So um, if we see currently, there's very little published research uh, that evaluates the differences between the flower milling technologies and uh, and and correlates uh, those differences between different milling methods with the, the, the pulse flower quality. Uh, so in this case, the research gap exists over there. And this study, uh, therefore, uh, we, we chose two different objectives here. So the first one was to evaluate the pulse flower properties as they're affected by milling method. Uh, and we use two different types of mills, single stream and gradual reduction. So you can also uh, term them as Furcar mill for single stream and multi-stream as roller mill. And we also looked into how the pulse flower properties were affected by uh, seed pretreatments uh, in which we used two, which was uh, moisture conditioning and mechanical scoring. Um, the materials that we used for this purpose were green lentils, uh, yellow peas, cobbly chickpeas, and navy beans. So when we come towards the methodology, we had we tried to check the effects of milling methods. With, and in this case, we used two different types of milling methods or two different types of mills, if I may, uh, for car mill for single stream and roller mill, which is basically a multi-stream. And in this case, we used four different types of pulses, as I mentioned earlier. And in terms of effects of seed pretreatment, uh, we, we used moisture conditioning and mechanical scoring for two different types of pulses, including green lentils and chickpeas. So uh, we, we studied uh, compositional, uh, physical, and functional properties. And there were three compositional properties, moisture content, protein content, and ash. Uh, lab color and particle size distribution is a physical properties. and uh, we just studied one functional property under the study, which was water holding capacity. Um, I will not go into the details of this table, but uh, we concluded in terms of functional, um, uh, in, in terms of compositional properties that the Furcar mill, milled flower, flowers, they basically had a lower moisture content compared to the roller milled flower blends. Uh, small differences were also observed in the protein and ash content of the two mill types and the ash contents of the brake flowers were significantly different and lower uh, than the fur car milled and other roller milled flower blends. So now this is interesting that why the fur car milled flowers had lower moisture content compared to the roller milled flower bl uh, blends because basically um, a fur car mill operates at about 3000 RPM while a roller mill operates at 1400 RPM um so so basically higher grinding speeds are likely to produce uh, more heat which resulted in more moisture to evaporate uh, from the pulse flowers uh, during processing um in terms of protein content of break and middle roller uh, milled pulse flowers we can here see that um uh, that the, that 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 the roller milled uh, reduction stream had a higher uh, protein content as compared to the roller milled break stream here in terms of green lentils. And we had uh, a similar trend for yellow peas. And in this case, we can see for chickpeas, we had a uh, roller milled uh, middle stream to one, a 2M plus 3M uh, and roller milled uh, 1M stream and the roller milled break stream. So break stream in case of chickpeas had very less protein content. Uh, and similar was the case with uh, navy beans, where basically the 2M plus 3M roller milled stream, middle stream was having the highest protein content as compared to roller milled 1M stream and the break stream. Um, 
flour milling methods when it comes to water holding capacities. Uh, so the water holding capacities were not very different uh, between um, for, for perker milled and roller milled flours. Uh, and there was a significant difference in the water holding capacity in green lentil for curl milled flowers compared to the break and middling and straight grade green lentil and milled, milled flowers. So um, when we uh, when we go towards uh, the color analysis, lab color analysis, um, there were not uh, very significant differences between the colors of unrefined pulse flowers and refined pulse flowers. We could see here in the green box here. Uh, you can see that the color values are not uh, very different between the different milling methods because on the top, in the top row, you can see the Perkar milled, uh, which is single stream. Uh, you can see the roller mill, which is uh, basically multi-stream. So you can see that the color is not very different. However, in the red, uh, in the red box, you can see that the green lentil for car milled flowers uh, and straight grade flowers had a different because you can observe some specks in, in the in the the for caramel flowers um, and this is because of the seed coat that was present in the flowers um, here we can see particle size distribution width span of uh, for caramel and roller milled uh, pulse flowers so um, here you can see that the particle size distribution for for caramel is way higher as compared to the roller milled uh, flowers in case of all the different types of, uh, be it green lentils, yellow peas, chickpeas, or navy beans. So what we concluded was in this, uh, what, what were our conclusions? So the conclusions were the lab color and the particle size are most affected by uh, the milling method. Either it is fur uh, car mill or it is uh, roller mill. So then we also concluded that the roller milling is basically the ideal meth, uh, ideal uh, uh, milling method because of its versatility, seed coat removal and separation. It has the capability to produce refined flowers and more homogeneous particle size compared to the fur car mill. Uh, and that is why we recommend that this is a better milling method uh, for uh, end uses in commercial food production. Category two, we will also look at the non-destructive characterization of pulse flowers from different milling methods. So uh, in this case, we have uh, tried to go with two different types of approaches. One is basically spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging based approach. And the second one is scanning electron microscopy. So we had four different types of flower, uh, four different types of pulses in this case, similar as before, chickpeas, green lentils, navy beans, and yellow peas. Uh, and the milling methods, major milling methods that we studied in this case were for car mill and roller mill. And we had different blends from different roller mills, um, uh, similar to the ones that we explained in the previous study. So the first objective here you can see is uh, we used hyperspectral imaging uh, based on the pixel based approach and based on the spectral based approach. And we tried to discriminate uh, pulse flowers based on the pulse type and based on uh, the milling methods. Uh, we used both these approaches and both these appro approaches worked perfectly, uh, perfectly fine uh, for us in terms of uh, characterization or classification of pulse flowers based on type of pulse and based on um, um, the milling method that was used to, uh, to, to, to make the flower. So the equipment that we used for hyperspectral imaging on the left side of your screens, you can see that that is a high, uh, that is a visible MAR camera that operates in the range of 400 to 1,000 nanometers. And on um, the right side of your screens, you can see a short wave infrared camera that operates uh, uh, in the range of uh, um, um, that operates in the range of 950 to 2,500 nanometers. Um, now. When we come towards objective two using uh, scanning electron microscopy, we uh, try to look at the particle size distribution. We try to look at the protein content and the characteristics of starch protein matrices. So the equipment that we used in this case was Quanta 650 for SEM analysis. Uh, we used uh, five different types of magnifications, which was 50, uh, 50x, 200, 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000. So these were the magnifications that we had used. 
Now, if we, if we look at quickly look at the results of uh, the visible NIR range when we talk about hyperspectral imaging and spectroscopic based characterization of pulse flowers. So here we can see that on the left side of the screen, you can see four different types of pulses that are basically uh, showing different colors, uh, navy bean, yellow pea, green lentil, and uh, chickpea. This is basically the pixel based uh, characterization. And on the left side, on the right side of your screen, you can see uh, spectral based scores plots here. So in this, the first plot, you can see that chickpea, green lentils, and yellow peas are being discriminated on the principal four component axis. And here we can also uh, see that navy bean is very clearly discriminated, which all because the navy bean uh, has a very different color as compared to the others. And here in this plot, you can see that we have for car mill and roller mills very clearly discriminated here. But still, we took the analysis to uh, the short wave infrared range. And here, we can see that we can actually discriminate the pulse flowers based on the milling method. Uh, and here, you can see that on the, on the spectral-based uh, modeling, we can see that this course plot clearly discriminates the roller milled samples, which are colored in green, from the fur car mill samples that are colored in, uh, in red. And um, here we also have uh, different kinds of 3D plots. And here we can see that if we take the example of navy bean here, so there are some groups within navy beans. And these groups are basically associated to uh, the different types of streams. So if you see here, this stream is basically 2M plus 3M stream, and it has the highest protein content. So you can color these scores plots based on what you're looking for and you can get a lot of information from them as well. Uh, so PLSDA models. PLSDA models are basically supervised classification methods and in this you can see here that uh, visible NIR range is basically clearly classifying the flowers based on the pulse type and swear range is basically clearly classifying based on the mill type. Uh, and these the differences in the visible NIR range can be associated to the color characteristics, uh, whereas the differences in the samples based on milling type here uh, can be associated to uh, the, the different kinds of chemical compositions that change during milling. Uh, when we talk about microstructural analysis uh, in, in, in the flower types, um, we can see that the particles were found to be in the range of, if you see this plot, we can see that the particles are in the range of five to 51 micrometers with uh, cellular fragments and protein bodies below uh, five micrometers. Uh, so the particle size distribution can therefore be attributed to the protein bodies, one to five micrometers, starch granules, 15 to 40 micrometers, and the whole parts, whole or parts of the cell above uh, 40 micrometers. Um, although these, although the differences across the pulse type may occur as well. Uh, so variability across samples suggests that pulse type and milling streams may cause significant changes in terms of uh, particle size distribution, uh, uh, particle size distribution as well. So now, um, if you see here, uh, based on the milled streams, the first, uh, the first plot, the diameter of the particles on the x-axis and uh, density on uh, the, the y-axis. So some difference can be noted among the fur car mill and the roller mill straight grid streams from density plot curves, including a narrow distribution for fur car mill flowers as compared to the roller mill straight grid streams across pulse types. So this could be attributed to the various forces of action of fur car mill, cutting and shearing forces relative to roller mill, such as compression, shear, and friction forces. So the different forces of action result in differentially fractured seeds and thus distinct particle size and density characteristics of the resulting flowers. So in this case, you can see that in case of fur car mill, uh, we have tried to discriminate and if you see uh, that that in this case chickpea is very different, and in this case chickpea is very different as well, um, we we tried to do it based on the mill streams, and we also tried it to do it based on um, uh, uh, on the chickpea, navy bean, green lentil, and yellow peas based on the pulse type, uh, to say simply. 
Uh, we have also published this paper uh, in LWT. If you would have, if you would like to have a look, uh, definitely please feel free to go on Google Scholar and check that out. Uh, protein content in terms of milk streams and pulse types. This plot basically shows us that uh, chickpea had a very low uh, protein content as compared to uh, the other streams, whereas the streams that were coming from navy bean had uh, a significantly high protein content for the middle stream. Um, so th this is how we tried to, but, but if you see before milling, navy bean had uh, the highest uh, protein content as well. And after milling different streams, uh, the protein content ranged uh, from uh, lower to higher. And in this case, we can see that green lentils have the higher, uh, high, higher protein content. OK, so when we talk about the characteristics of starch protein matrices in terms of pulse type, this is interesting. We have chickpeas, navy beans, green lentils, and yellow peas. So we can see here, on uh, in terms of chickpeas, there were uh, pores uh, that were present on the chickpea starches. Um, <clears throat> we can see the pores that were present on the chickpea starches. And then here, in terms of navy beans, we can see uh, the SEM image, which shows a greater number of starch protein matrices. And the traces of bran particles were also clearly visible in green lentil flowers. And uh, this can be attributed to the uneven distribution of nutrients and pulses, which affects the, the milling process. So this was one of the most interesting things that we observed uh, in case of chickpeas, the, the, the pores on the starches for chickpeas. And what we concluded in this case was that visible NIR and SWIR can be used for classification uh, or discrimination of uh, uh, pulse types as well as the milling methods. And scanning electron microscopy also showed that the protein bodies were finely distributed in case of Furkar mill and straight grade streams of roller mills. And they have actually similar protein content. Um, and the reduction flower streams had more starch damage than the break flower streams. And the chickpea flowers had more visible pores. And as I mentioned about the navy beans and uh, had more starch protein clusters and they were brand found in uh, green lentil flowers. So um, <clears throat> when we talk about the industrial applications of, uh, of, 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 of these technologies, so uh, we, ca we can see that we, we can get better uh, end products uh, if we do more research into uh, how which stream can be used for which end product. And in that case, we will have, we will make the consumers happy and uh, enhance the profits for, uh, for the companies as well. Um, so now this category here uh, contains uh, pulse flower characterization. So this is category two. Sorry, I think there's a type over there. So molecular characterization of green lentil flowers using synchrotron x-rays. This is the last, uh, uh, these are the last four slides that we're gonna go through very quickly now. Uh, synchrotron x-rays and Fourier transform uh, mid-infrared techniques. So uh, in this case, we the parameters that were evaluated include the particle size distribution, protein content, starch crystallinity, lamellar structure, uh, starch and protein quality. So in this case, we used only green lentil flowers, and uh, there were different blends of flowers, and there were different streams of flowers as well. Um, so in this case, if you see the, the, this slide, basically this shows us lamellar structure uh, using small angle x-ray scattering. So lamellar structure basically refers to the repeating distances of, uh, of starches, and this is important towards the, the end texture quality of your finished product. So uh, what scientists have found out in research is, that, so in this case, if you see this plot, we have the low protein, we have uh, reconstituted whole flower, we have straight grade, and we have high protein flower. So in this case, we can see that the high protein flower basically had a different lamellar structure as compared to uh, the rest of them. And um, in between 0 0.09 and 0 0.15 and strong, uh, th this is basically uh, the, the, the region where they find repeating distances uh, for different starches. So what researchers have established is that the, the weak band from uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.09 corresponds to a starch lamellar uh, 
repeat distance and this band can be attributed to um, the thickness of the crystalline and amorphous regions of uh, the lamellar structure. So we can we can we can say that lamellar structure for low protein uh, reconstituted whole flower and straight period flower was not very different, uh, but uh, for high protein flower it was way different as compared to the others. Um, and then we come towards this starch crystallinity um, using powder X-ray diffraction, and in this case. Um, it is basically used, this technique is basically used to determine the long range crystalline order of, uh, of the starches in association with uh, the double helix packing. And generally the legumes like green lentils themselves uh, exhibit a C-type uh, starch pattern, which is somewhere between the A-type, which is basically cereal starch and the B-type, which is uh, tuberous starch patterns. Uh, so overall, the degree of crystallinity uh, for flower blends uh, basically is higher than flower streams. So the degree of crystallinity for crystallinity for flower blends may range somewhere between uh, 15 to 25 percent, and for flower streams may range between 21 to 24 uh, percent. Except for high protein flowers, because in case of high protein flowers, the degree of crystallinity may range from uh, 15, may range uh, maybe around 15%. So higher the degree of crystallinity, it can lower the enzyme digestibility by uh, slowing down uh, the starch digestion process. So that is why measuring starch crystallinity can be crucial uh, towards uh, developing your end products. In the end, we, we also measured the functional properties using uh, FTIR. So if you can see here, uh, we have uh, some protein regions uh, and then we have some carbohydrate regions. So the protein regions are ranging from uh, 1600, somewhere from 1600 to 1500 uh, wave number and uh, the carbohydrate regions are ranging somewhere from 1700 to 1600. Uh, wave number. But if you see this plot here, that is of interest to us. Uh, this plot basically is a three-dimensional principal component analysis scores plot. And we can see that we can uh, discriminate the middle and the break streams and high protein and low protein, uh, reconstituted whole flower and straight grade flower. We can actually discriminate them very well using um, uh, the the mid infrared FTIR uh, technique, and if you can see that uh, one M middle stream is very clearly discriminated, uh, and and you can see different kinds of groups. So this technique can be very useful uh, as well. So in conclusion, uh, for this last study, we can say that the flower streams and flower blending affects the microstructure of the resulting flowers most definitely. Um, and starch crystallinity and lamellar structure. Uh, in, in that case, for all flowers, samples exhibited a similar pattern. Flower blends possessed a higher degree of crystallinity than flower streams. And it can be established that specific flower blends and mill settings are suitable for a targeted product. Uh, and further studies are definitely recommended to optimize the mill settings and flower blending ratio to achieve the end products with desired qualities and nutritional parameters. Uh, in the end, I will like to uh, thank University of Saskatoon, uh, Canadian Light Source, Pulse Canada, Cereals Canada, and University of Manitoba, which all worked together uh, to have these uh, wonderful results in the end. And we hope that we will definitely work in collaboration in the future as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. But thank you very much for your talk awesome. today. It was very thank interesting. You. And thank you, everyone, for being here uh, this afternoon. We'll have um, the recording on the website in probably a week or so. All right. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Madaster. That was fantastic. And we'll talk to you all in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you very much. You have a good day as well. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.